What do you say we get started on our wrought iron door knocker project? The first thing that has to be done is the wrought iron has to be reshaped or reforged into some other material. I'm not going to make a door knocker with any dimension that is found on this bar, so I need to change that. I want to draw out some of it to three-quarter inch square, more or less. If it's a little bigger, that's okay. I don't want it any smaller, though. And I want to draw some of it out to about a quarter by two inch to make the back plate. I think I'm going to leave it all connected to do that. I'm going to start by trying to forge out the three-quarter inch square bar on the end, leave two inches of it unforged, and then draw that out into my quarter by two. And that way I should have something to more easily hold on to for each phase of this. And if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll cut it and work it. But cutting two inches off of this and then trying to hold on to that while you forge it gets really tough. So if I can forge a three-quarter inch square bar on the end, I can easily hold that in tongs while I do this in. Hope that makes sense. Now there is one little problem in doing this, and we may not succeed very well. And that is, what do you forge it in? What do you get it hot in? Wrought iron is forge welded. That's how it's made. It's all forge welded together. And so it is a forge welding product right from the start, which means when you work it and you're doing a lot of reshaping, you should try to do it at welding temperatures so that you don't break the welds apart. Unfortunately, wrought iron also forge welds at a much higher heat than mild steel does. My gas forge will easily forge weld mild steel. I don't know if it's hot enough to forge weld wrought iron. So the solution to that is to work in a coal fire or charcoal or coke. Unfortunately, if you've been paying attention, you already know that we have extreme fire danger in our area right now. We've had minimal rain all year. Temperatures are higher than normal. It's drier than normal. We've had un unusual high winds that just None of it is normal weather for our area. So what that means is that burning any fire that could put any kind of spark or ember out of the shop is completely unreasonable. Now truly, burning a coal fire, there's very little risk of that. Uh, coal and coke really don't put out embers, but there's always a slight risk. There's that one in a million chance that something makes it up the chimney and makes it out the chimney and I'm not going to be the guy on the news trying to explain why I just burned down a community because I thought making a wrought iron dragon was more important than being safe. So we're going to do it in the gas forge and if that doesn't work we're just going to put the project on hold until I feel like it's acceptable to run the coal forge. One of the other reasons not to run the coal forge is simply the smell of smoke. Well, that doesn't hurt anybody and nobody complains about that normally when you're living in a high fire danger area and people start smelling smoke from your property, they get pretty nervous. And I find that it's better to be a good neighbor and not make my neighbors nervous about what I'm doing or make them upset about what I'm doing up here than it is to try and just do whatever I feel like doing and say, tough luck, Charlie. So there's no reason to push that. This project is not worth putting my business at risk and it is certainly not worth putting my home or the homes of my neighbors at risk because that one little ember managed to make it up the chimney and start a wildfire. So that's my little little lecture on fire safety and being reasonable. We're going to forge this in the gas forge. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, we'll get back to it. It may be a few months, but we will get back to it. So let's go light the gas forge, bring it up to the highest temperature I can get it at and see what happens. Doing this project in the chili forge running at full welding heat is going to be loud. I need to leave the forge running during the entire operation so that the heat stays high and I don't have to reheat the forge between every session at the anvil. So it's going to be loud. I probably will not do much if any narration throughout the video and will instead try to do a voiceover at the end and then I can turn the volume down and you won't have to listen to that forge run. Right now I'm standing outside the shop and my guess is you can still hear, hear the forge. I'm going to wear hearing protection for the whole thing so I hope this works for you and we'll see what happens. 
I'm going to do most of this with a four pound diagonal peen hammer that makes the drawing out a little bit more efficient. And we'll do quite a bit of this at the anvil just to show that it can in fact be done at the anvil. Although again I'm swinging a four pound hammer and that does get a little heavy. The next thing i got to figure out is i got to find better tongs. This pair I started with isn't real great and this flat jaw set isn't really holding it as well as I would like either. So if I scrounge around in the shed, I found this great big pair of antique tongs, and they are a much better fit, and that's the pair we're going to go with. So it's just a matter of drawing out like you would anything, only in a much heavier bar, and we're going to keep this as near welding heat as we can. Very high heat anyways, and that makes rod iron behave better, plus it's way easier to forge. Rod iron's a little easier to forge anyways, just because it's softer than, than mild steel to start with. As always, working over the horn is a, a good way to speed up the drawing out process. Flatten it from time to time at the anvil and take care of any mushroom. Just a matter of reheat and forge, reheat and forge. If you were to do this entirely by hand, it would be a fairly tiring operation. Certainly having a striker available would help. I'm trying to create a shoulder at about two inches from the end the tongs are holding on to to give me enough on that end to later draw out into my back plate, which will be about a quarter by two. The rest of this I want to make close to three quarters square, maybe a little bit larger. Trying to take full blows. This isn't some place to be timid and take light blows. The, the harder and faster you work, the, the more energy goes to the material, and it helps keep it hot. But this does wear you out, so I'm not going to finish this this way. Certainly it could be done. And hopefully this gives you an idea that even drawing out this one by two inch piece of wrought iron is possible by hand if you want to do it. Wearing hearing protectors mostly because the forge is just so loud it's annoying. The glove on my left hand helps me get closer to the, the hot flame front from the gas forge. I'm really quite impressed with how well this is holding together. I'm not getting any delaminations, which is frequently a problem with wrought iron if it's not hot enough. I wasn't sure if the chili forge would be hot enough to make this work, but it sure seems to be. Find that shoulder just a little bit there. This is starting to really show some signs that we're making progress. That's always encouraging. When you first start off, it seems like you might never get here. It's about an inch by inch and a quarter at this point. I'm going to go ahead and set this pair of double calipers for some of the measurements I want to be able to check. This has three quarters for the three quarters square and then two inches to check my length on that part that is going to be the, the back plate to make sure I leave the right amount of material for that. And now I can measure that very easily and just leave the caliper set and check the width. And then back to back to work. just have to keep after it. Persistence does pay off. And if you needed to, you could put this aside, let it cool, and come back to it another day if you get tired of working this hard. But really, I would start with three quarter inch square bar if I was making this out of mild steel. Well, let's see what else we can do. I've got all these big pieces of power equipment. 
The hydraulic press would make short work of this if I'd started with the hydraulic press. A little set of combination dies, and I could actually go too far with it if I'm not careful. It's real easy to, to squish too much with this 24 ton press, but it does make short work of it. If I had stop blocks in here, or kiss blocks as they're referred to, to set the three quarter inch dimension, it would be much easier to get an exact size off the hydraulic press. But since this is not something that I do all the time, I didn't see any reason to set up any kind of stop blocks. I just wanted to show that there are other options besides doing this by hand, if you have big equipment, but also just to show how some of the equipment I have in the shop works. As I try to refine this with the flats of the combination dies, you'll notice it kind of stalls out as the press builds up pressure, but then it starts to to forge it again once there's enough pressure on the, the ram. That's just part of the the way the press works as the material gets a little bit cooler and as you're working a larger area. Working under the drawing dies is much much more efficient. And here we are under the treadle hammer. So another look at one of the big pieces of equipment. And you can certainly do all this with drawing dies and flat dies under the treadle hammer. This has about a 60 pound head, it's all controlled by your legs, so when your left leg gets tired, you switch to your right leg. Really quite an efficient tool, other than the fact that you uh, can wear yourself out using it. But for being a non-electric tool, all human powered, it's really an excellent tool to have in your shop if you're looking for a big tool. I highly recommend a treadle hammer. If you only have one tool, I don't know if it's the one you'd have to think about it, but it's a good place to start. Now I put the flat dies back in the treadle hammer and I can clean this up a little bit. Anytime you go to larger flat dies, the effect on the material is much less than the round drawing dies. That's why you use the drawing dies, but the flat dies will refine the the shape much more precisely to get you down to that square shape that we're looking for, or at least close to it. We're not going to quite get it done under the treadle hammer. We're going to move on and look at some other pieces of equipment. As you can see how much work we've got done here. This is really, really coming along quite nicely. Again, the wrought iron is staying together very nicely. They haven't had any delamination or cracking or falling apart. Time to check the size again here real quick. And we're not quite to the three-quarter inch square yet, but we're getting closer. And we're pretty close to the two inch there. Let's go under the Little Giant. Now this 25 pound Little Giant would not afford the two inch dimension. That's too much for the space under these dies. It's just not really something that we want to do. But once it's down to about an inch, it does pretty good. So we can draw this out a little bit more. I tend to keep drawing dies under the little giant. That's about all I use it for. And that makes it a very good tool to use in combination with the power hammer or the treadle hammer with flat dies to do some of the drawing out under the drawing dies and then go to the flat dies to the final. But we're actually getting very close to our finished size here. Little Giant's a very nice tool. I'm glad to have that in the shop. But next we'll go to the bull hammer. This is a 120-pound ram weight on the bull hammer. And it's got some relatively large flat dies. These are dies I made that are larger than the dies it came with. And that gives me plenty of room for auxiliary tooling to work under the hammer. And it really is a, a pretty nice way to go for a lot of this. It's kind of wearing out. It doesn't have the control it used to. But very close. The calipers fit in most places, but not quite everywhere. So we're just going to clean that up a little bit more. 
you can see how much faster this goes with the other tools. But again, if you don't have them, it can be done completely by hand. Now time to switch tongs. I can now hold on to a pair of D-bit tongs on the three-quarter inch square end, and this is going to be much easier. One tool we haven't looked at yet is a fly press. So I put a couple of little dies in here that were never really meant to be drawing out dies, but they just so happen to, to work okay. You'll notice I'm taking a fairly short stroke that keeps me from stepping in front of the camera and knocking the camera over because the tripod's pretty much right in my way. Taking a longer stroke, this would, would work better. But it's actually doing quite a nice job on the, the fly press. I don't typically use it for drawing out. I tend to do more precise things with the fly press. It is certainly capable of doing it. And I may have to look at this some more. I have not explored all the possibilities of what a fly press will do. It's been worth the uh, money I paid for it, worth having in the shop for the things I do with it, but I can probably get a lot more out of it. And we'll look at this more for future videos and look at all the possibilities that you can use a fly press for and probably try some more serious drawing out. I think it would be worth a look at it. And again, this is all manual. My right arm is holding on to a handle that swings the, the flywheel around and runs the screw down. up the shoulder a little bit there. This will leave quite the deep impressions and it's not real smooth. So if you're doing all this under the fly press, just like the other tools, you would need to switch to a set of flat dies. This is down to about a half inch, and it's about two inches wide. It's really doing quite nicely. It's taken, taken half of the, the thickness out and drawn it out. But let's go back to the bull hammer and clean this up. Uh, we could go back to the anvil and do it all by hand, but since we've already got power tools in the video, not as much a tutorial as it is just a, a chance to do something with the wrought iron that Roy sent. We're going to go ahead and use whatever tools do the job best. And in this case, I think it's the, the power hammer to draw this out a little bit more. That'll take all those ridges out that the drawing dies into the, the fly press put in there. Flat dies are not always the most efficient for drawing out. You can do a lot of drawing out under them. And there are some other tricks to doing that other than working the whole material, taking little tiny bites and feeding it very slowly in, one bite at a time. It makes a big difference. When I'm not trying to get a lot of fast drawing, I'm more concerned with getting a flat, even finish on this. To draw out more, though, you can go to a Puller, just a, a round bar on the end of the handle. It's about a three-quarter round bar. Sorry, my hand's in the way. And this helps us draw it out quite efficiently. And it's one of the advantages of the flat dies under the power hammer is that it allows you to use all these handheld tools under the power hammer. Sometimes you might switch tools three or four times in a single heat while you're forging. Here I'm going to go to a, a flatter. The flatter essentially does what the flat dies do, but because it is smaller, it puts more pressure. It has less surface area to act on, so it, it has greater effect in the area that it is touching. So the flatter makes it a little bit faster. Going back to the flat dies helps clean everything up, straighten it, keep everything in line. 
flatter a little bit better if I stand on the other side. Now this helps create a nice smooth surface and get rid of any of the fullering marks either left from the fly press or from that, that fuller that I was using on the, the power hammer here. You can see how much longer this has become. We've really got a lot of material out of this piece of wrought iron. I'm very impressed. Got a little bow in it to straighten that out here. Things are looking pretty good. Next thing I want to do is cut this off. And I did not put a soft plate under this to cut. So I don't want to cut all the way through on the power hammer. We're going to cut part way from both sides with a hack. The hack is like a side chisel. I'm going to go to the back of the die and I'm going to angle this a little bit so that when I cut through, the chisel slides past the die. And that just goes to the floor and that's all we had to do. And I just clean up the bar where I cut it a little bit, make sure that that end is nice and clean. And that's pretty much everything we need to do with this bar. Looks like we're about 7 eighths an inch square. Pretty darn nice. It's going to work for the project just fine. And we're going to clean up the back plate where it was attached to that bar. And spread it with the cross beam. This is about the only place that I experienced any delamination was cross beaming this where it was cut. Both the cutting and the cross beaming had a little bit extra stress, but it's a very short little area that's split. And for wrought iron, that's really very good. I'm very happy with the way this came out. Just clean it up a little bit, try and keep it straight. And any other forgings or other work we need to do, we'll do to this as part of a project. This is just stock preparation. But now we have both pieces we need, both of the major pieces of stock. Let's see what we got. Well, what did we end up with? We have a piece that is about 7 eighths square and 14 inches long, although those are with ragged ends, so we won't be able to use all that. And we have a piece that is quarter by slightly over 2 and not quite 12 inches long, which is actually longer than I was going for, so I think we have more than enough material to work with. I guess that means it's going to be time to make a sketch to show you exactly what I have in mind with this. I've got a pretty good idea in my mind, but it helps to put it down on paper and check and make sure that it will fit these pieces. I actually think I'm going to have a little bit of leftover. The back plate is probably too, too long right now because the dragon will curve out, so a lot of this will be out in front, and it'll curve up and back to to make a part of the tail of the dragon that strikes the plate. So probably eight inches will be plenty, but there's plenty of material to get that out of, and I think we'll be able to do that. I think by the time I finish the dragon, a lot of this will get drawn out. I'll leave it big for the head end, and it'll get tapered down towards the tail to be more like a tail. So this will get a lot longer, and we'll probably have to trim some off. And that'll work well for us because there are a few other parts that we need. We need something that acts as a pivot point for the dragon. And so if I can cut some of this off to make that out of, that will be to our benefit. And we may make fasteners. I may make nails to nail this to a door. Uh, I won't make screws or bolts because those are too difficult to forge lag screw or wood screws or lag screws. I suppose I could make regular nuts and bolts, but I doubt that I'll have enough material left to do that. So we'll see what happens. Now we took an opportunity there to show that yes, you can draw this out by hand. That's a big piece of material. That was inch by two inch material that we drew out. And we did the majority of the rough shaping with a hand hammer. That was a four pound hammer. I don't recommend swinging a four pound hammer for very long unless you're just really in good shape and you're used to it. 
That was about all the four pound hammer work I wanted to do. So it was a good opportunity to also see that all of the other tools that I have in the shop would get you there. You don't need all of them. If you just had one of those, it would come very close to getting you to the final size, and then you could refine it by hand. Now the little giant power hammer won't actually forge down a two inch tall bar very easily. It'll sort of fit, but it kind of tap dances because it's just too big for that small hammer. You need bigger hammers to do that. Once it gets down to an inch or three quarters of an inch, the little giant does it just fine. Now there is one other option that you could use that I did not show. That's one of these things, but this takes another person. If you have a friend, neighbor, or family member that is interested in blacksmithing or just willing to help out in the shop, teaching them to strike and to swing a sledgehammer is a huge benefit to you. There is so much that can be done with a striker. It, there are times that I would think that I would trade all of those other tools if I could just have a striker on hand all the time. Problem is, you've got to feed them and they want a paycheck and health insurance and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, my shop doesn't make that much money, so I'm going to stick with the electrically powered equipment, the presses and the power hammer, and even the human powered treadle hammer. But if you have somebody that wants to help out, if you've got a neighbor that you can just have come over for a, an hour to help you swing a sledgehammer, that makes it a lot faster. It makes it more fun. It makes it more social. You learn some skills. They learn some skills. It's a great thing. If you've never seen anybody work with a sledgehammer, you might take a look at the video of doing the blacksmith helper that Stuart Shirley demonstrated and we videotaped. He does a lot of that with a striker and a sledgehammer and I think that shows you some of what's capable with that. I think there's some also some little bit of video from last year's Rocky Mountain Smiths conference that shows Rachel David swinging a sledgehammer or working with a striker. I think I have both where she's the striker and then her uh, partner was the striker. But either way, it's a good skill to learn, and it really can be beneficial in a small shop and can keep you from having to buy big power equipment if you don't have room for it or if you don't have the budget for it. You can get a lot done with a good energetic striker. And this is a small hammer. This is about a six-pound hammer. A striker swinging a 14-pound hammer can get a lot of work done. And if you're really good, you can use two or three strikers. Lots of YouTube videos out there, old videos, showing gang strikers making things like anchors and big chains. And it's really very impressive to watch. You ought to go look for some of those. Some more little details on working wrought iron. I said at the beginning of the video, we have to work it hot. Remember, wrought iron is made by forge welding the iron bloom back on itself multiple times. So it has layers, it has fibers, and it's kind of like wood, and you can work with its strengths or you can suffer because of its weaknesses. And the weakness comes into play sometimes if you want to split it. It's very easy to split, just like wood is easy to split, but it will also split when you don't want it to. If you're working wrought iron to square this up and you keep it square, it works pretty well. If you let it get off into a diamond and you work it, then you're creating a shear plane because you're pushing this side, the top over this way and the bottom over this way. And sooner or later, you will shear the iron and it will cause problems. The wrought iron shearing across itself isn't uncommon. There's just a little bit right on the end of this piece and just the tiniest little crack on the end of this piece where I cut it off and then peened it wider to spread it. That's very minimal. This is a high quality wrought iron. Roy did a great job with this. Some of the wrought iron I've worked in the past would not have taken this kind of abuse. It also speaks well to the chili forge that it got up to high enough heat to be able to work this that easily. Wrought iron welds at a higher heat than mild steel and a lot of gas forges will not get up to a high enough heat to forge weld wrought iron. They'll forge weld mild but they won't get up that next few hundred degrees to do the wrought iron. But that's also one of the reasons wrought iron is easier to work. You can work it at a higher heat and not worry about burning it. It has essentially no carbon in most wrought iron, or very low carbon, and therefore it doesn't burn as easily. You can heat it higher, you can weld it at a higher heat, and it makes life a lot easier to be able to work it at those high heats. 
So wrought iron is an interesting material. It is not a straight across substitute for mild steel. They work differently and you need to develop skills to work with one or the other. Some of the stuff you get away with with mild steel, working at a little lower temperature will haunt you with wrought iron because it will fall apart and start to split and shear. Punched holes near the end on wrought iron. If you're making a bottle opener out of wrought iron and you just punched a hole, it's probably going to break. That would be better to wrap it around and forge weld it and work with the strength of the wrought iron instead of working with the weakness of the wrought iron. But those are all things we can cover in future videos if we do more wrought iron stuff. And when we make some of the tools out of wrought iron, we will address some more of the issues with working with wrought iron. In the meantime, I'm pretty happy with the way this went. We have our materials. I'll need to do a sketch. And I will explain what I've done with a sketch when I get that done. And then it will be time to get on to the actual dragon project. I may still do a, a test piece or two just to make sure that everything's going to work right. And we're going to go through those carving tools that we did, the figure carving tools, and show you what all those tools do and do a little test with each tool just to show you what they're capable of in hot iron. But I need to finish grinding them. They're all hardened. They're all tempered. Most of them are are ground and cleaned up and ready to sharpen but not quite all of them and we'll do that and then we'll get back to work on those and show you how they work. Hope that was interesting. Hope you found it enjoyable. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't hit that subscribe button already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you, you know what's going on and you don't miss any of the videos. Stick around, watch some more videos. Feel free to share them with your friends or share them on your social media page. But then do make time to get out to your shop, make something, Challenge yourself, have fun, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.